treatable proposition. Uh, in 1984, I was charged with uh, indecent assault um, with four other men on one female. The charge should never have been laid, but it was. What happened was, uh, the five of us went up to, to our local pub. I'd only been out of jail two weeks. And I was living in a, in a halfway house with these other guys. Oh, three of them. The other one was uh, living with his brother. And we've gone to this pub, and one of the guys uh, had known this chick that walked in. And uh, she just walked straight over to him and asked him if he'd fuck her on the pool table. And uh, Brian just laughed his head off, you know. So did I. All of us who heard it just laughed. So we were having a few drinks. Um, this girl, she was probably... Oh, she obviously was off her face, you know, but we were so far off our faces, it didn't matter. Like we were drinking. And uh, she was dead set on getting a root out of Brian, and Brian said to him, look, if you root for me, you root for me mates too. I... I personally evolved, have been involved in, in maybe over 30 uh, group sex, orgies, gangbangs. A lot of these have been involved with the woman not actually knowing that she's being raped, where she's been unconscious through alcohol or, or through drugs. Um, you get to a level in, within your own self that you cease to think about the woman as a person and you actually just see her as an object. I think all up three, three of us had sex with a woman and uh, one guy was so pissed he just spewed in the corner and he was out to it. And the other guy, he had the clap, and uh, which we didn't know at the time. Uh, he, he ended up having, uh, oh, she gave him oral sex, you know? which uh, thankfully went last. <laughs> There's also a sense of camaraderie about a gangbang, where you have a good mate and you will share a woman with a good mate. It's, it's a very binding act with you and your friend, with you and your mate. Um, the sense of camaraderie would be possibly the biggest aspect of it. It's, you do everything together. You're having sex. Once you've had your turn, that's it. You know, there's uh, no respect. You don't, respect doesn't even come into it. All you're doing is getting your rocks off and getting off, you know. It's uh, whip it in, whip it out and wipe it. It's, it's very advantage. She's drunk and you will take advantage of her. Yes, there's no thought to, to her welfare. You will, you'll just take advantage of her. Do you, regard, do you regard that as rape? No, no, I don't. Why is that? Because to me that rape is something completely outside of that environment. Rape is is an individual decision to dominate, to, to humiliate, to completely overpower a, a victim. And if the victim is unconscious at the time or has no real say in the matter in a coherent manner, then the rape isn't technically a rape because the power the dominance and the humiliation are just lowered in their aspect. And uh, that was that. We didn't think anything of it, you know. Uh, we went back in the shed and just went to sleep. 
Next time we woke up, was the coppers coming down on us and uh, putting their guns into our heads and just saying, don't fucking move, you know? We didn't know that this girl's gone to a, to a house and said to them, uh, I've just been raped by six blokes. Most assaults are not sexual, they're physical. And those who inflict this violence are almost always men. And their most common victims, other men. Alcohol plays a part. It's often in or nearby pubs and clubs. And the offender is usually young, under 25. And he's out to prove himself. Psychologists and academics are now beginning to look beyond the physical nature of this violence. They see as well a sexual component that drives these men on. It's more than just winning a fight. They're out to assert themselves, to prove themselves, to establish their sexuality. These men are experiencing the rites of passage from puberty to full manhood. Going into pubs and picking fights with people was an extension of the way that I was raised in that I always had to prove to myself and to everyone around that I was a man. Uh, I used to go out on Friday, Saturday nights, um, just to go out looking for fights. I wouldn't, you know, like if a fight started, you know, I'd be there, I'd be getting into the fight, but I'd be walking down the street and I'd just start a fight with someone just for the hell of having a fight. A lot of the time then I go out of my way to look for a fight. You know, it's a case of boredom a lot of times. And um, well, when I wasn't boredom, I suppose I was going looking for a good time. You know, you went out, you got laid, you got drunk, you had a few fights, so it was a good night sort of thing, you know, but... You know, I'd go pick on the biggest bloke around just to build my own self-image up. How easily did you get involved in fights? Extremely easy, extremely easy. You know, it's just like a, a, a clockwork toy, wind me up and point me in the right direction. Or well, pay for my girls to snap the pool key on, uh, give them a whack over there, just slow them down a bit and then pick up a pool. The actual bloody bar stool, on the old steel bar stools, and then start with them. When you start with them, oh, anything gets, you know, your broken jaws, cheekbones, noses, legs, arms, and then if it connects, you can pretty well break something every time. The brawls are rarely reported. For those victorious, it's a good night. For the vanquished, it's one they'll want to forget. Usually the victim has little warning. This violence is unpredictable and explosive. If I could get an edge by belting him when he wasn't looking, that would be what I would do. And um, I would beat that person to the ground and would kick him until they stopped moving. And it all started out just a fight that got out of hand. And um, basically, well, this place insulted me by just called it a heap of shit, which that's the worst form of insult you can give a biker. It's just not done now. And um, the response to that was just turn around and punch him, three or four punches. And he's fallen over. When he's got up, he's picked up a piece of wood, a tree branch. He's come at me with that, and automatic reaction was he's pulled my knife out. I carry a, a knife on my hip in a pouch, you know, in open view, it's not concealed or nothing. And I just come out automatically without thinking, automatic sort of response. And it's been, it was just bang, bang, stabbed him a couple of times. It was over and done with, and had a straight cut. It was just happened that quick, you know, it just doesn't take much to escalate and get out of proportion. I was at a stage of my life where uh, I was very desperate for money. Um, I'd never been one to uh, do armed robberies or anything like that. Perhaps that might have been the way to go. But I conceived this idea that uh, I'd go to a gay bar, look around to see who'd uh, have the most money, let him buy me a drink, 
go back to his place and rob him. Well, that was fine. Uh, I got back to his place, but I ended up killing him instead. Um, I should have realised that he was a homosexual and that he was going to think I was too. And he made certain advances towards me that was just a, an insult to my manhood, uh, you know, and it really upset me. So I let loose on him. Um, what happened? I mean, what, what uh, specifically happened? How did you go about doing it? Well, I... Uh, he was at a stage where I'd severely injured him and I sort of realised that, you know, this guy might be able to identify me and I thought, well, I better, I better kill him. So I did. So I just uh, went to his kitchen, got the Wiltshire Stay Sharp knife and I cut his jugular vein and that was it. I thought nothing of it at the time and even the next morning when I woke up, I saw it on the television news, you know, I thought, you know, that's bad stuff, you know, and then I, it, it hit me, you know, I thought, did I do that? You know, that was me, hey, and like, it took me a long time to come to grips with it. Why they didn't just kill me then and there too like they did Peter? I don't know. I believe that I did, I did talk my way out of it. That is true. How did you, how did you talk your way out of it, do you think? Um, by saying, oh, don't kill us, I'll do anything you just want. Just let us go. The boy who survived was streetwise. He came from a, a very tough neighbourhood. He knew that if he played along with the killers, he had a chance of living. It's very rare in these situations that uh, another witness, another boy particularly, survives a crime of this sort. It's only occasionally that we're able to gain an insight into the brutality of male assaults on young boys. And while it's estimated that only one female rape in 10 is ever reported, attacks on young males is perhaps the most hidden of all crimes. It's a little over 10 years ago. It's Monday. Terry and his best mate are wagging school. They're running away from home, heading south to Melbourne. We started hitchhiking. And we're starting to think twice, you know. No one's going to pull over and get us to lift. And we've seen this particular car go past very slow. It was just creeping down the road. All the other cars were just cruising past it. And us two men, and they both looked at us very suspicious like, but we didn't take any notice. and there they were, they were parked on the side of the road. Me and Peter looked at one another and we said, well, what the hell, we're not going to get down there otherwise. So I approached the fella under the bonnet and I asked him if he wouldn't mind giving us a lift down the coast. And uh, the driver said, yeah, sure. One of us left hop in the back and the other one left hop in the front. I said, OK. I said, um, what's wrong with the car? And they just said it was just a small overheating problem. But as soon as I got in the back and Peter got in the front, they were off. They just drove straight off. And 
And then, um, straight out of nowhere, the fellow on the back with me was Paul. Pulled out a shotgun and pointed at my head and told Peter if he moved, I was dead. Then, uh, Rob, that was the driver, he pulled over and handcuffed Peter to the dash. It was a um, four-wheel drive Mitsubishi. Had a bar across the dash where the glove box compartment is. And, um, and they drove off again like they did before. It seemed like we were driving forever. It was just pitch black. No houses. Just the road, car and us. And they turned off left down a track. Paul had got out with a gun still pointed at me. He put cuffs on my toes. And they both dragged me around to where Peter was. And they started laying into me, giving me a hiding. They just laying there rolling on the ground, in pain. They left me again and they went and got Peter out of the car. Unhandcuffed him from the dash. They just ripped his clothes off, just literally ripped his clothes straight off his back. And he just left him standing there stark, na stark naked. And they just started forcing his clothes down his mouth, down his throat. And they both pulled out a knife each and just took it in turns, stabbing him. One stabbed him in the front. Laugh, giggle, carry on. And the other one would do the same, but from behind. Fourteen times this happened, just back and forth, back and forth. Peter had ripped this gag off his mouth. And he was just screaming. He was screaming. So one, if there was any cars on the road, they would have heard that scream. And Paul just got the gun and just belted him right across the face with the butt. I heard about five cracks. I looked at the gun, the gun was in two pieces. Peter was out cold lying on the ground. I thought he was dead. And they picked me up, grabbed, gave me a shovel, and Paul dragged me through the bush, dig a shallow grave somewhere. Tried about ten places, couldn't dig no grave nowhere. It's just all the roots from the, all the mangroves everywhere. Couldn't dig nothing. So by the time we got back there, Rob was kneeling down beside Peter. He's doing up his fly. I don't know if he, what he did. Then they threw me down and down on Peter on top of the Peter. And at knife point, they made me go down on Peter and suck his private part. So they made me start digging the hole in the ground right where we were. I dug it about a foot, foot deep. Probably a bit longer than what Peter was. And they made me drag Peter into it, put Peter in it. Alive. A vegetable, but alive. And fill it in. It's clear now that on that night, Terry was destined to occupy a second shallow grave. The slim chance he had for escape was to pretend to be a willing participant in the torture and murder of his best mate. Only his raw instincts for survival saved him.
A few weeks later, two Australian soldiers are charged with the boy's murder. They enter a plea of temporary insanity. This attempt to diminish the responsibility for their crime on this night is ultimately foiled by a resourceful police officer. He uncovers a discarded note from one of the murderers, revealing their plan to feign insanity. Defence lawyers often put the argument that because people who commit sexual crimes uh, commit such horrible sexual crimes, therefore they must be insane, a bit uh, unhinged. But the reality is that uh, most people who commit terrible sexual crimes, including murder with sexual overtones, know exactly what they're doing. They plan it, they fantasise about it in their mind, they get their kicks in committing crimes of this sort. They must be held responsible for their actions. We as a community cannot excuse people on the grounds that they are insane. They are not. He was the master telling me what to do and I was a servant or slave and obviously it was a power thing. He needed to assert himself over me against my will. It was little to do with uh, sex. went to work early in the morning like I usually do and I went up the stairs to go into the ladies' toilets to check my makeup. After drinking all night, I went into a TAFE college. I was leaning on a banister, seen a woman come in. She went into a toilet, I followed her in. She was putting makeup on when I got in there. I said to her, how about it? I couldn't scream because there was no one around except for a few cleaners on the bottom floor. So he ordered me to go into the end toilet and I had to comply. cubicle. I don't know if she was scared or whatever, you know. I was really pissed. I didn't really care anyway. Did you, did you threaten her at all when you Not asked her? Not at that stage, no. Did it sound aggressive or...? Oh, I could have sounded a, a, aggressive. Being pissed, you know, I got a fairly deep voice. Who knows? She'd know. I was paralysed with fear. I didn't want to fight, I didn't want to risk my chance of being thrown against a wall. I mean, it wasn't a toilet where it's all tiles and there was no one around. And uh, at one stage during the sex, I said to her, I'm going to go down and bite you on the clip. Uh, I was in, it was interpreted that I was going to go down and bite a clit off. You know, that's a pretty fierce thing to say. And if I said that, then uh, that's bad. But I don't think I said that at all. But do you think that she may have got that impression? Uh, well, it sounds like it, you know. I'll smash your face in or I'll bite a certain part of your body off. I'll just punch you or... I mean, that coupled with having sex with a person you didn't want to have sex with against your will, plus being a bit drunk and very angry. Uh, she was telling me to hurry up, you know, because the workmates would be coming in soon. I didn't care, I, you know, I was just so fucking pissed, I didn't worry. I said, yeah, yeah, right, eh, you know. Eventually someone came in next door to us and this was towards the end anyway, she saw two pairs of feet and whispered voices and she went outside and reported it. 
Meanwhile, by that stage, I was in the negotiation stage of, you know, I'll give you my phone number and uh, my name and you can call me up later. That was my ticket, I thought, to get out there a bit quicker. I didn't look at it as if I was raping her. I just, I was having sex with her, not in the best of places. Uh, I definitely wasn't in love with her, you know. It was just one of them moments where you thought, well, he's a quick fuck, you know. By this stage, he was feeling, I think, a bit uncomfortable because people were sensing we were there. And uh, he'd had his fill. He'd got what he wanted to a degree. And uh, that was it. It was the longest hour. Julie's uh, compliance at the time of the rape, uh, I see as a, as a means of survival. It often is. But in Julie's particular case, not long before the, 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 the rape attack, she had been uh, living in a relationship with a, with a fellow who uh, was prone to violence towards her. And she herself learnt that to survive these attacks, uh, one had to comply. And uh, when the rapist attacked her in the toilets, she very quickly recognised this as uh, familiar territory for her. The familiar territory of violence between the sexes touches the lives of one Australian home in five. And it doesn't discriminate. It reaches into every street, every neighbourhood across this country. Sexual violence is not confined strictly to the act of rape. The abuse can be psychological, verbal, emotional and physical. In one Australian state over a 12-month period, 90% of all calls to police concern male assaults on female partners. It, it's more or less uh, an argument to a rage within a split second. And that's when I'll spin around and attack. Um, I, I feel as though I'm 10 foot tall and bulletproof. I feel as though I could kill my wife within a second.